We're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 22nd of June, 2005, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Frank and middle initials A. Smith. And I was born 2225 at Buffalo, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? I had three years of, uh, of high school, but I enlisted on my birthday. And I just, uh, 2001, under the, the governor's direction, I, I have a high school diploma. Oh, you received it, okay. Through. Yeah, we had quite a party. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you remember where you were, um, how you heard, and your reaction to Pearl Harbor? Yeah, I, um, I was sitting in the living room with my, my folks, and we heard it. Did you hear it on the radio? And, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, actually, it, it, there wasn't much of anything said in the family for quite a while. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was kind of traumatic, even though we did realize that we probably were on the brink of war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, you said you enlisted. Um, why did you select the Coast Guard? Well, uh, another lad was going to go in with me, and he wanted the Coast Guard, and he chickened out at the end. <laughs> but I enlisted in it, and of course, once that you got a declared war where the Navy takes us over, at that time we were under the Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first. Uh, up until the beginning of 43, I was on a 83-foot cutter um, working out of Cape May, New Jersey. Now, did you did you have any basic training prior to that? Oh, yeah. What, where was that? Uh, I had training in Al Algiers, and, and that isn't Africa. <laughs> That's across from New Orleans. And then at Manhattan Beach. In Brooklyn, and then they sent me to uh, the State Pier in New London, Connecticut, and I had training on the underwater detection gear and the sound gear, where I ended up on a destroyer escort. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you were on a, a Coast Guard cutter initially, you said. 83 foot mm -hmm. of um, Could you tell us about? Uh, being on that, how long were you on the cutter? I was three months on the one that was 83, 305, and another three months on the 321. And basically, uh, we had charges only that we could roll off and hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. And the group of us, the squadron, would take off from there and go down to the Chesapeake Bay and uh, drop charges <laughs> just to drop charges and they kept the submarines down and because the bay was full of ships they couldn't get out mm -hmm. back at that time. They had the wolf packs. And, mm -hmm. and so you had a patrol route? Yeah, just to deter. So what was your, your basic route? Where did you go from to Cape May and most all of it was off of the uh, Chesapeake Bay. Do you know if you sunk any subs at all or? Not. At that time, sound gear was more or less primitive and uh -huh. once you got on uh, the DEs had the most. Okay. Uh, so how, mu how much, of, how many on a crew of a uh, Coast Guard cutter? Mm -hmm. I believe there was, it's either 12 or 14 of us were on it, mm -hmm. uh, on each one, and we tied up. It was a naval air base there in Cape May. Now it's a training facility mm -hmm. for the whole thing. 
So your base, your home base then was Cape May. Yeah. <coughs> um, could you describe like a, a basic day what you did? Well, uh, I was at that time, they call it strike, and I was striking for the salmon raid. I was first class seaman. And, uh, I was down in, in the bow and it was mostly listening device. Mm -hmm. And topside, I didn't see much of. I was down there most of the time mm -hmm. on patrol trying to pick up any screwing. Mm -hmm. How long was was a typical day? How long did you sit at, at that equipment? Were you there eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours? Oh, it, it depended on when we got relieved, and I, I'd say eight or ten hours at least. Uh huh. And then we pulled back into the state pier and tied up. Okay. Unless we pulled the evening out, then of course it was three different groups going out. Mm -hmm. How many, um, <coughs> you said you traveled in a squadron? <coughs> yeah. How many were in your squadron? There was uh, <coughs> five in each one. And incidentally, I wasn't on them, but they ended up over in uh, Normandy. They were picking the people up out of the water, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the landing. First four or five hours. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I wasn't on it at that time. I was on the destroyer escort. Okay. Now, was that a Coast Guard cutter or Coast Guard ship also? No. That was a Navy destroyer escort. It's uh, more or less a sister ship to the one we have down in Albany that's tied up. Oh, it was later. later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I commissioned, I was in a commissioning crew for the mill, the 383, and I had three years on it. Now, how did you end up being in the Coast Guard but assigned to a Navy vessel? Because we were under the Navy. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, so a, a Coast Guard crew member could be sh shift switched into the Navy then. Yeah, we mailed. We we were kept as a nucleus all Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. But uh, our skipper, all of our officers, and all the enlisted men, they were all in Coast Guard. And we had. Um, I believe there, well, there was six of us in a division, and we had two, four, I think there was five divisions of Coast Guard manned, and they were the Edson class, the superior escorts. Had to, for that time, they had the most modern equipment, mm -hmm. as far as radar and sound gear. So you did the same job basically on the mills, you worked with the sound gear? Yeah, I, until I, that's where I made all of my rating, petty officer rating. <coughs> now when you were with the Navy, was uh, when you were transferred over to the Navy side, was, was the equipment uh, better equipment or more adva technically advanced? I wouldn't say so, I, it's just that the first ships I were on had a, I would almost say obsolete equipment on, uh -huh. you know, and, but as the war progressed, it naturally we got more modern equipment. Mm -hmm. The cutters had just as good of a equipment as the destroyer escort. Okay. Now, when you were on the mills, how many Coast Guardsmen were on there with you? We had 207 enlisted men and 13 officers. Okay. All right. Um, can you tell us about some of the things you did on the mills? Where were you stationed? Well, <laughs> naturally, I was stationed on the mills. Yes, right. But I mean, did you? Where was your port? Did you stay here okay. along the, the states, or did you go yeah. over to? No, hopefully, we come into this. Uh, back into Brooklyn Navy Yards was our home port. Mm -hmm. But of course we'd been in uh, 
if I started at the top, uh, we shook down at Costco Bay in Maine, and we were in Boston, and, and this is stateside, and we pulled into Brooklyn, mostly always in Brooklyn, uh, one time in Philadelphia, Norfolk, uh, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, New Orleans, we were commissioned in Houston, Texas. Now were you considered a plank holder? Yes, I am. Okay. I am both, uh, I'm plank holder on the Slater, which is in Albany also. Okay. Yeah, that's, I got that on my convention jacket. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, um, after you were along the coast, you, you went to North Africa? We, yep, the first, uh, the first port, of course, we made a stop in Bermuda, but then we, we hooked up with uh, other ships. <coughs> And we ended up at Casablanca on the first one. And uh, then we returned to the States. Then the next one across, we went to uh, through Gibraltar and Algiers and Oran, Bizzerti. And I was shore base as an SP for a short time and a little town called Ferryville. It was 12 kilometers from Missouri. And uh, the next... <coughs> now when you were in the Mediterranean, what did you do there? Your ship, uh, what did it do in, while we you were... were... We were escorting uh, LSTs, different landing craft. Oh, okay, so you were on escort duty then? Yeah, okay. there was 225 of us in the convoy. Mm -hmm and 13 destroyers and aircraft carrier as the escort group. Our, our group was uh, Division 23. Mm -hmm. Did you ever encounter submarines on your way over? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we picked up uh, quite a few contacts. And I'm told you've actually got a have visual, mm -hmm. you know, to have credit for um, sinking. Mm -hmm. Were you ever under air attack while you were in the uh, yeah. we, Mediterranean? We were under, a court, on April 1st, we was under, uh, it was the coordinated attack, but there were submarines and planes. Was, well, where where was it in the in the Mediterranean? It was in the Mediterranean, and we were you could see the shoreline off of Oran, and that's when we uh, the commander of forces in Northwest Africa when we got to Bizzerti, uh a group of us got the Navy commendation bar. There was a. Uh, Liberty ship and it was loaded with ammo. And we got hit under the port anchor. And I really think our skipper was looking for a, a, a star of some kind. Because he tied number one and five of flying up to that Liberty ship after we picked up the crew. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take much to volunteer to go aboard. I tell you that when you knew it was an ammunition ship. <laughs> and that forward hold had uh, hospital supplies. And luckily that's where they took the hit. And we pumped. Carpenter's mate would burn a hole in the deck and they were shoving hoses over it. And I'd shove it down the hole. And we pumped enough water into that that the, with a loaded vessel, the screws come up out of the water and the mm -hmm. bow was under it. Well, we'd fill that thing right full of water in the bow. And uh, we tied on, well, we were tied, but we tied one for towing. 
and a British uh, tug come out from Oran. And the two of us towed it over and we left it at Oran mm -hmm. so they could unload and salvage. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we had quite a few times that uh, the planes would fly behind the, the hills in Northwest Africa. <coughs> and usually they had a large Dornier plane that would fly over and he'd start dropping flares. Okay, hold on. Okay. He'd start dropping uh, flares to illuminate. Mm -hmm. And then the, the planes would come right up over the hills and stay right on the water with the torpedoes. Yeah, it, it, you got nervous then, <laughs> but uh, once you broke clear and in the open ocean, it wasn't bad because we always assumed we had the advantage, which we didn't always, but we thought so. <laughs> All right, now, uh, after you were... Uh in the uh, Mediterranean, where, where did you go from there? We, we got, uh, come in and, and we were refitted and they took off our, we had torpedo tubes and they took the tubes off and they put four twin 40 millimeters on the boat deck. So that increased our anti-aircraft or whatever had to be used on, on the surface. We ended up, we had a quad 40 on the stern on the boat deck and four twin 40s besides 12 20 millimeters with a twin barrel and uh, the main battery of three three inch fifties. And of course we had eight K guns uh, and two racks. They were for the depth charges mm -hmm. for anti submarine. Mm -hmm. And in the bow we had uh, the rocket that went out uh, that we called hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. They formed a circle mm -hmm. down in the water. If they made contact, they went off. Otherwise, they didn't go off. They didn't hear anything. So we were well armed. So, yeah. Where were you refitted? Where did they do this? Yeah, we got refitted in Brooklyn. Again. Brooklyn again? Okay. Okay, after you uh, were refitted, where did you go? Uh, then we went into North Atlantic route. And... Uh, uh, I think of it afterwards, I brought my mom back up from Londonderry, or Derry, either mm -hmm. uh, handkerchief from um, their linen. And I didn't know till after the war, my mother's family, that's where they came from, was Londonderry. Oh, really? Island. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I kind of wish I'd have got back again at that time it was it wasn't really um, I wouldn't call a beautiful place it was but they did have um, one time I don't think they were over eight or nine years old there was two little boys and her sister and we let them afford and give them stuff to eat you know and they sat on the the ladder to the mess hall, and they sang for us. And boy, they had beautiful voices. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you gotta excuse my throat. Oh, yes. I was on a breathing machine. Okay, hey, um, what was it like on your ship? Uh, how were the crew members and the officers? We were a close-knit bunch. As a matter of fact, we've had reunions not only with the National, but amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the National uh, is 
every year we're in a different state. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's all that served on the destroyer escorts. But we have our own little one. And now, now as I said, we had 207 enlisted men. So probably if you had replacements, you know, that you would replace, why like, you, you probably were near to 400, 450 mm -hmm. uh, people that were in the Second World War on that ship. And now you can count them on one hand. Mm -hmm. That's all yeah. that's left of us. Mm -hmm. And they recommissioned that vessel that we were on, and uh, they were used by the Navy, and they converted it to a radar vessel. They were down in uh, the South Pole region in Australia during the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now they come in to replace us for reunions. We're, we're the old men that sit <laughs> on the sideline now, but we still get together. Now, while you're on that, what happened to the mills? Eventually, did they scrap it or? No, it came into Green Cove, where most of them ended up mm -hmm. in Green Cove, uh, Florida. And it was decommissioned and mothballed. And uh, then when Viet, no, no, it started in Korea. Mm -hmm. And they recommissioned our whole division except for one vessel. And, uh, and they turned that over to the Coast Guard as a cutter. So it uh, it saw it saw action in World War Two and Korea, and then again in Vietnam, they refitted it mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. a radar DER they mm -hmm. called it. So it's um, but we had a I would say we had a real good crew. We stuck together good. We had a good skipper, and, and most of the officers were good. So, now, were you at the Norm at Normandy for the invasion, off, or off the shore? Yeah. Okay, could you describe that? Uh, it was the only time that we fired enough to lose all the ammunition. We never run out, not only there. And um, it was a tough first day. How far and off the shore or the coast were you? We were close enough that every now and then you could feel a hit on the bottom of the sound gear. Mm -hmm. And they'd have to move out. And I, strangely, it, uh, I saw on, uh, it wasn't too long ago, that they gave credit uh, this fellow was moderate to give credit to the destroyer escorts for getting up close enough they were trying to fire right into the pillboxes. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was quite a few, I, I could name two or three of them that when they got hit, you know, they beached them and they were using it for temporary power to generate. The Fisk was one, and mm -hmm. oh, I know I'm good. And otherwise, we had a lot of, of, of good trips, <laughs> you know. Do you remember any incidences that stand out as being either amusing or inspirational that come to mind? Well, one was that we had a we had a, a, an ensign that came aboard, and of course we always had a sea bat for any of the new ones. And what we had was an old tin tub, and it had absolutely nothing in it, and you cover it with a canvas. And we curiosity always kills a cat, you know, so we keep talking and one would look under and another and 
we got him to come up and take a look. Well, we have a, a bat, <laughs> a flat board, and the fellow on the DC racks has got it. You know, he set it up near there. When he bent over to look, you know, <laughs> he got it. You know? <laughs> and uh, he was kind of mad, but the skipper says, no, 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 that's good. You join the crowd and we'll be happy. You know? <laughs> so that was uh, kind of amusing. And, um, we had different times. I picked up a on the sound gear one time. I never knew it until after the war when they, they put monuments up at the Academy in New London and we were invited up and went up. And the uh, first class carpenter, I, we went on Liberty, was good, good friends and everything. He never said nothing to me. And afterwards, he says that he had wood that he was saving and he hid it in the carpenter's room there. And it caught a fire. So he says he, he hauled it all out and threw it in, and here's this gob of lumber. And he said, would you believe it? You picked it up on the sound gear. <laughs> so we went to general quarters. <laughs> <laughs> and that and didn't, um, didn't know a thing about it until afterward. <laughs> and incidentally, I never saw a depth charge explode when they come up. Mm -hmm. I never saw one because I was always in the sound room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told Louise, we was watching a program on television. I said, you know, that's the first time I saw that. And I never realized there was that much powder that you were almost shrouded with mm -hmm. smoke coming out of the K guns when they fired them off. Mm -hmm. So actually, I had to wait about 55, 60 years to see one go off. <laughs> <laughs> now did you, uh, what did it sound like in the sound gear? Did you have earphones on? It, we had earphones in the beginning, but then we had the speakers afterwards. Mm -hmm. So the speakers weren't bad, but it would not, the sound gear, if you were aimed, if you brought it around quick, trying to pick up your target again. and. The explosion come off while your relays would all kick off. It's safety managed down mm -hmm. major, you know. Mm -hmm. So then you had to take all three sound rooms and kick them all back in. And they were 440 volts, 2,500 amps, and a lot of power was mm -hmm. used on it. Did you ever have much problems with your gear? Did you have to have it repaired quite often, or, or was it pretty <coughs> efficient? Yeah. Well, I, uh, it lasted pretty good, but of course we didn't have transistors, you know. There yes, were right. Tubes, so yes. we were always had to be replacing them. And uh, the only time, now we lost the dome and had to have a new one. We were off um, Alfred Haven, South Wales, and a hurricane came in. And before we got clear, we were moored. And before we got clear of the harbor, we, the bottom part tore the sound gear. Now, could you explain what the dome was? Well, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, your sound gear goes out inside your stainless steel diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Now, how large was this? Oh. Approximately? That dome is probably eight foot or ten foot in length and it's shaped like a football and it goes right up into the keel when you you got half of it sticking out mm -hmm. when you secure it and the width of it i'm only guessing on this but i would say it's probably maybe four foot this way but it's actually like a shape like a football. Mm -hmm. you know, stainless steel housing mm -hmm. goes around it. And when it you yeah, energize coils, it's in rock salt solution. And it expands real kick fast and kicks these little rods. They all hit and it puts out a supersonic sound through the water. 
and it returns. <laughs> I don't want to give a, a lesson on how to operate, but it, on ideal conditions, it's 4,800 foot a second. So it's all computed so that you have the range for the, going by the amount of mm -hmm. time out mm -hmm. returning. So that that became good. The only thing is we never could find the depth of the sub. And at the end of the war, they come out with what was called sword gear. We didn't have that on, but they were experimenting with a number of ships. And there was a sound device on the bow that pointed down, and that could compute how depth, how deep the, mm -hmm. the submarine was. So if we'd have had that, it would have been real good. That didn't yeah. come along then until the end, of, toward the end of the war. Yeah, it was pretty well along towards, I'd say, the last year. Now, with a sound dome, when you went into like a harbor or something, did it have to be cleaned or? No, no, but you had to retract it. Mm -hmm. but I, that was all done electrically. Mm -hmm. uh, you pull your sound gear up into. So the it went hull. right up into the hall itself. Yeah. It was just uh, probably a quarter of it that protruded. Okay. Okay. Um, now, when uh, after Normandy, what were you mostly on convoy duties for the rest of the war? Or? Yeah, that's when I got married. When we come back uh, uh, to the states and. They, I had, we had a few repairs had to be done to the vessel. So I, I said to my wife then, I said, you know, the Germans don't really care who they shoot at. I think we better get married. So we eloped, which made a big hit with both families. <laughs> but it's been a good marriage, and uh, the rest of the time it was escort duty of convoys, you know, mm -hmm. getting the material over. Now when were you discharged, finally? In 1945, October 1st. Do you remember uh, where you were um, and, and your reaction when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Yeah. We, uh, we were still flying colors at half mass coming towards the United States when they made the announcement um, that the war had ended. So I I always know all I, all I got to do is to back up mm -hmm. because it was uh, as far as I I don't know officially but actually the eighth of uh, May was when the war ended. Mm -hmm. So he had to have died in, in April. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know the exact date. What were the feelings of yourself and others around you when you heard about this? Felt bad. Mm -hmm. And we really did because uh, the war was, was over for all pretenses in Europe. And uh, he didn't live to see it. Mm -hmm. He was so close to seeing mm -hmm. it, and yet he didn't. What kind of celebrations were there on the ship when you heard about the end of the war? Well, there was a lot of whoopies, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, of course our crew never drank, so <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't much of a celebration here. And I, I forget how many days before we came in. We came into Brooklyn there. Mm -hmm. War was over, and then it was. Uh, I had a rehabilitation leave, thirty days, leave. and then the vessel was made ready for the start. <coughs> and I didn't go uh, to the canal. Mm -hmm. They were in the Aleutians and China. Uh, quite a few spots that they went, and they returned in January. 
of uh, 46. So I had November, December, and January that I missed, you know, mm -hmm. before it was in uh, green cold. But I don't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever get to see any USO shows at all? Yep, I watched um, Bob Holt, Bob Holt, and there was Jerry Colonna, mm -hmm. and Francis Langford, and they had a dancer, Tony Seven. And I don't know whether that's S V E N or I S E V E N. I don't know him. <laughs> but they they were at Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, and they were still having air strikes coming through when he was over. I have a picture of uh, the four of them on the stage, you mm -hmm. know. It was like a platform and a tent behind mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it was packed. <laughs> um, after you were discharged, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yeah, the first home that we had, we uh, got the mortgage through the GI Bill, the 100%. Mm -hmm. did, you ever, did you ever use the 5220 Club? Oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I walked sidewalks until from uh, 1st of October, I went to every manufacturing plant there is in the city of Buffalo trying to beg a job, but uh, there was, uh, I don't know how many thousands discharged you know, mm -hmm. in that period. And uh, finally I, I went to work for Spencer Lenz that's with American Optic. Mm -hmm. And I worked about well, up until spring, and uh, then fortunately I got a chance to go into operating engineers. So I had 18 or 19, almost 19 years working out of local 17 in Buffalo, and they were good years. And I tipped over and broke my back, so. It I had to quit that occupation, and I ended up working for New York State with Labor, Maine. I was the investigator for the Labor Department mm -hmm. out of Albany. Okay. So, Did you join any veterans organizations? Uh-huh. I got a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> I belong to the VFW, the American Legion, the Coast Guard Combat Veterans, the Destroyer Escort Sailors <laughs> Association, and I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now you said you, you've attended reunions. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you from after the war? Yeah. Right after the war? Yeah, I'm still in contact with them. Okay. All of us that we, we ran the ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This year, yeah. I don't know if I said it or not, but we're supposed to meet in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And that'll be the early part of October. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, I think it taught me to to any respect any command that's given to you that's above your you uh, and really to appreciate everyday living you know I uh, my wife and I both have tried to to raise our family with good <coughs> morals mm -hmm. you know, and of course ourselves Right. Mm -hmm. We fall short sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Could you uh, hold this under like this and tell us where and when that was taken, if you recall? Yeah, I would want that here. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. That could? Yep. Uh, that was taken, my mother had it taken, there was actually four brothers at that time and two sisters. And then later we had two more brothers, 
At this time, it was right after I was discharged. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, to have me alone, my, my son did a lot of erasing in the background. And uh, he, he's got me in the chair alone. I actually had one of my younger brothers sitting on the, uh, the oh, arm okay. of that chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, I think it's about the only picture I have. It's okay. okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yeah.